Well, my name is Ted Gardner, and uh, I'm an interviewer for the Public Library uh, Project, uh, which was started by the Library of Congress Project for Oral History of World War II Veterans. And uh, uh, my interviewee today is Arthur Baum of Cincinnati, Cleves, Warsaw Pike, on the west side of town. And uh, it's March the 22nd, 2007, and uh, we're here at the main library, and our camera operator is Dennis Daly, uh, experienced uh, videographer, and uh, also present is your daughter Valerie here. My daughter Valerie. That's so nice yes. to have her here with us. But anyway, Arthur, what we're doing, and uh, you're so wonderful to uh, submit yourself to this sort of thing, but uh, hopefully we'll have a good time. Uh, the importance of it, of course, is recording history. And uh, as you know, uh, at the end of World War II, we had about 14 and a half million veterans. Now we're down to about three and a half million veterans. And it's very important that we get your story and others like you uh, recorded because once once we're gone, you know, That's and it. if we haven't told anything, anybody about it, it's gone forever. And that is a, that's a great loss to our nation. Uh, you'll be given, given a DVD from this interview for your family. There will be a copy here at the public library that anybody can come and look at. And also a copy goes to the Library of Congress Archives in Washington, D.C. So this is an important thing, and this is a recording of history. To, uh, we need to get zeroed in on Art Bauman, and uh, where were you born, Art? Here in Cincinnati, 1919. 1919, my goodness, so you're... I'm 88. 88, yeah. that is great. You're a little bit younger than your brother-in-law. Uh, uh, yeah, <laughs> he's about 90 now. He's 90, yeah. Yeah, and, and in reasonably good health. Yes, he is. Went to his birthday party uh, on last December. I was up there. I was out at the house. Yeah, I, I was there. We were there. I guess we just didn't get didn't, around. Yeah. I, we I mean, there were so many people there that I did not know. I know. And, uh, well, this is a great opportunity. So you were born uh, on the west side of town? No, in, um, what would they call that? The area around Cincinnati General Hospital, or what used to be the Cincinnati General Hospital. Oh, oh, oh. What would oh, that be? Mount oh, yeah. Uh, uh, University District? University, University District. District. Yes. Yeah. Because my father was employed as chief electrical engineer oh. at, the, uh, at, the hospital. at the Cincinnati General Hospital. Oh, isn't that so? And he spent the next 50 some odd years there. Boy, I'll bet he'd had some stories to tell. Well, no longer. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. <laughs> yes, he did. But you grew up with that, so you're... I grew up with that. Yes, isn't that wonderful? Where did you go to elementary school? Westwood. Westwood? Because we moved when I was uh, just about a year and a half old. We moved to Westwood, mm -hmm. and I spent the uh, rest of my life on the west side of town then. Did you go to Hughes High? No, no. Oh, you must be kidding. <laughs> Western Hills High School. Western Hills. You, I'll bet you knew Jack Schiff, didn't you? I knew of him. You knew of him? Yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah. He was, he was older, but uh, I know he was a Western high, Hills High graduate. Well, the, um, uh, those days, 1919 on, of course, uh, just prior to uh, the big Great Depression, um, I was born in 1921, so I remember very well. You're a youngster. I'm just a youngster. <laughs> Absolutely. That's, that's what Walter Foster tells me all the time. But anyway, uh, it, it, those days were, were really something special, weren't they? Absolutely. Absolutely. I know. How, how did you... Your memory goes back very, very far and very well, I'm sure. Yeah. What do you want to know? I can tell you. <laughs> Same thing. Know. What was it like in, in Cincinnati in those days? What? Uh, for me, yeah, it was. Uh, I didn't know any better, so it, it was great. Yeah, it was great. Right. 
We always had plenty of food. Uh, we had a nice place to live. Uh, I had a sister who was two years older than I. And um, of course, living in Westwood, uh, there were a lot of other boys around my age. And, uh, and we stayed together up well, till and through high school. Well, but then all of us went to different colleges. And, sure. Uh, Where did you go to college? Ohio University. Oh, in Athens. Yeah. Wonderful place. And uh, so, to me, it was a great place to grow up. Right. And uh, when my wife and I, she was a West Sider mm -hmm. also, and uh, her father owned the Offelman Baking Company, if you remember that. It was one of the major bakeries at that time. Yes, I remember the name. And anyway, uh, we built a small house and uh, wanted children, of course, as most married couples do. Of course. But we had to have a house with two bedrooms. Mm -hmm. And uh, we went all over town to try to find a suitable house. Every time we'd come back to the west side of town, <laughs> It felt like putting on an old shoe. Yes. And we, we have to find something on the west side. Yes. And um, <clears throat> and we did. Uh, the one that we're living in, that I'm living in today, I just lost my wife uh, about a week, ten days ago. Oh, really? And uh, uh, but I'm still living. Well, there. and your wife is your wife is with you. Oh yes, and up until uh, the eighth. Uh, 8th of March, but uh, so we we think the West Side is the only oh, place yeah. to live. <laughs> well, you know that that's uh, that is the pervading feeling of people who lived and grew up on the West Side of town. There is something special about the feeling of community and family out there that is really uh, outstanding, uh, <clears throat> and of course the West Side. Furnished so many, so many people for the arms uh, services oh, yeah. during during the World War II. Uh, let's go back a little bit into your school days. Uh, <clears throat> for example, at uh, Western Hills, uh, uh, did you have any hobbies or interests oh, or activities? Oh yes. Tell us about that. Well, uh, I played the clarinet, so I was in the. Uh, marching band and also in the orchestra and they used to put on some fabulous musical right. uh, uh, things there. Right. Uh, it was not really a hobby. I really didn't want to play. I played because my parents told me to. Yes. <laughs> and back in that era, you did what your parents told you to. Exactly. But uh, beyond that, I was always interested in mechanics. Oh. And um, uh, I got to the point where I finally buy an old car, mm -hmm. which was a Model A Ford. I paid the total sum of $25 for it. <laughs> so and it, nice. it operated, it ran Good, to yeah. some extent. What year was this, you remember? This would have been in my junior year in high school, which would have been 1937. Oh, about that. Yeah. So I fooled around with that, and then of course, when it came time to go away to school, I couldn't afford to to make that trip in it, and I, I sold it, and I think I made ten dollars. Oh my gosh! But um, <laughs> well, you and your brother-in-law work on cars together, don't you? I started the hobby on old cars. I got him his first. Model T Ford, Isn't that and then he went on from there. Right. On on one occasion, uh, I was having parts. I've got five old cars now. Uh, two of them belong to my wife. She was in the hobby also, and she loved to drive them, loved to be involved in the activities. That's wonderful. And having some parts replated for one of the old cars. I was telling this guy, I said, now listen, you have to be careful with this because you, 
I grind too much on it. He said, you don't have to tell me. He said, I restore old cars too. He said, as a matter of fact, he said, I've got two of them out there in the garage that I'm trying to get rid of. Oh, what do you have? Well, I have a 1956 Thunderbird and a 1957 Thunderbird. Wow. And um, I said, you want to sell them? And he said, yeah, yeah. And um, <laughs> my wife always wanted a 57 Thunderbird. Uh, and I, many people are still in love with that car. Yes. But in any event, um, I said, well, I said, I've got a brother-in-law that may be interested in the other one. Maybe we can make a deal. So I got in touch with Walter and I told him what the situation was. And um, he said, yeah, he said, I'll, I'll take it. So uh, he got the 56 Thunderbird, which he still has. Mm -hmm. I got the 57, which is a, what they call a basket case, and um, then restored it for my wife. And we still have that. So, uh, and then he bought others along. Sure, <laughs> hey, sure. So you drive that 57? Oh, yeah. Sure. Yeah, well, you can drive it. I mean, uh, 88 years of age, I don't get out too much. <laughs> but uh, in any event, yes, we try to keep it operable. Yes, well, that's, that's very important. Well, then uh, 1938 was your class? At, at, at Western Hills? Yes. So in 38, you were out. Uh, and did you go directly to Athens then? Oh, yes, I went directly. Okay. Well, you know. I mean, well, after, after the yeah, summer. Yeah, that following. No, did you, uh, did you go into engineering? I went into industrial engineering. Hmm. Yes, at Ohio University. Right. And, uh, <clears throat> and of course, I was, took the clarinet with me and I was in the band up there. Uh -huh. But um, uh, I was there until my third year, I guess about my third year, I lose track of time. And uh, Well, 41 so I, came I, along the war at the end of... Well, I had signed up in 1940 like everybody did my right, age. Right, right. And um, then it was about 19... What, 40, 42? See, that's all. You got it all I, in the book. I got it all there, in the book over there, yeah. Sure, but in any event, uh, I had, uh, I was supposed to be called up, but they gave me a deferment because I was in an engineering college. Right. And they deferred me three times, and then finally I was called before the board and and asked for another deferment. And this man on the board said, I went in the First World War, you're going in this one, no more deferments. So that was it. <laughs> so uh, then they, uh, of course, shortly thereafter, I got noticed to appear for physical examination. Mm -hmm. And um, I think it was down here at the courthouse at that time. And I came down for that and they, they asked me what branch of service I wanted and of course, being interested in mechanics and all that kind of stuff, I wanted to be in the Air Force. Right. Uh, I wanted to be a pilot. Mm -hmm. I mean, doesn't every a guy 22 years old? Absolutely. So I wanted to be a pilot. And uh, so they gave me the examination and finally they, uh, they came out and they said, well, or the doctor came out and he said, I hate to tell you this, but he said, you passed great, he said, except for your depth perception. Now you have to keep in mind that this was before 1941, Pearl Harbor. before Pearl Harbor, and they were very stringent with their requirements. Oh, absolutely. And, uh, Boy, I was, I was really, you know, down low. He said, listen, he said, I, I got a suggestion for you. He said, um, you can become an aviation cadet in communications. He said, you get the same kind of cadet training without the flying uh, business, 
but um, uh, you wear the same uniform. Uh, we went through all the same hazing that they went through of course. in uh, uh, pilot training. So it sounded good to me, and I signed up for that. Now, what did that involve? Where, where were you sent? Uh, I was sent to Scott Field in Illinois. Oh, yes. And, uh, famous, famous place. Yeah. yeah. And uh, <clears throat> so I went through a six months training period there and uh, was uh, uh, graduated as a second lieutenant. Now, this was radio and. Well, you have to understand that. Uh, the Air Force, it was the Army Air Corps then, yeah, right. before the Air Force became a separate entity. Right. And um, uh, the airplanes had a tremendous amount of communications equipment. Yes. Communications within uh, people on the plane, communications between the plane and the ground, uh, identification equipment, what they used to call IFF, identification friend or foe, yeah. uh, all that kind of stuff. And uh, plus the fact that you had to have uh, inner squadron communication, communication between the squadron and the, uh, uh, the um, oh, what I want to say, headquarters. Mm -hmm. So uh, there was a lot, a lot to be done in that oh, area. Very, very important. And, uh, Absolutely. So I became a squadron communication officer, and that's how I got overseas in the Air Force. Now, when when you got <clears throat> when you got your orders, um, uh, the orders were directing you to where? Where were you supposed to go? I, I started out started in in Columbus, Ohio, Fort Hayes. Oh yes, Columbus, Ohio. They put me on a train, and I forget where I went. No. Uh, go to the East Coast? No, no. I think I think it was Fort Ben Harrison, oh, and then Indianapolis. Indianapolis, and then got on a troop train oh, yeah. to the West Coast. The West Coast. Yeah, and um, the the feeling was that. Uh, at that time, the Germans were sinking about 70% of all the shipping going over the Atlantic. And we were going to get on a troop ship that at that time was the largest passenger liner around, not counting the Queen Mary. And that was the USS America. Oh, yes. It had never made its maiden voyage. Famous ship. It was beautiful. So they. They converted it into a um, troop, ship. troop ship, and uh, so we were supposed to get on there. And there, there again, we enter into this interesting relationship I had with my friend Charlie Weisbrook, uh, in which case we were meeting, as I mentioned to Dennis, sitting in an officer's mess waiting to be called. And uh, they were laughing about this guy living this, next to the zoo in Cincinnati. So we got talking and stuff that his father worked with the, uh, the mechanical engineer at the Cincinnati General Hospital. My father was the chief electrical engineer. <laughs> and they had known each other for years. Right, so here we were, first time we had met. And right. then uh, we finally got the orders to ship out. And uh, we ended up in the same cabin. They had 10,000 troops on this ship. It was just crammed. Oh my goodness. And, which is why they did not want it to go across the Atlantic. Right. So we went, we left uh, from Oakland, California. We went down past New Zealand. We stopped at uh, Australia. Hmm. We got off the ship in Australia, which was interesting. Then we went up to Bombay, India, and uh, we got off at Bombay, India. Hmm. And that was really interesting because I can remember walking down into the center part of Bombay and looking around and saying, 
So this is what they mean by a foreign country. I mean, it, it was so totally different yes. from anything I had seen up to that point. What a broadening experience for a young oh, man. Oh, yes. Oh. If, if you live through it, I mean, <laughs> nothing like it. <laughs> yeah, that's absolutely true. So, um, but anyway, uh, then we were there, uh, what, three or four days, I guess. Uh -huh. And um, got, back up, got back on the ship. We went up uh, the Dead Sea, Port Say, which is at the northern terminus. Sure. And that's the southern terminus of the... Uh, Red Sea? No. Well, it was the Red Sea, yeah. but the, the canal... Uh, Suez Canal. Suez Canal. Yeah. And um, uh, so we got off the ship there. We got on a, a troop train that must have been at least 200 years old. <laughs> <laughs> Wooden cars. And Wooden cars and... Oh, noisy, smelly, oh, dirty, oh, oh. dirty, you wouldn't believe. And made the 75 mile trip up to uh, Cairo. Uh -huh. And then there was a base set up at uh, Heliopolis, which is a little, uh, was an original settlement in that area. Ancient. Yeah, very ancient. Ancient. And uh, so we were set up there, and uh, we were there, I guess, six to eight weeks trying to find something to do. And uh, we did a lot of sightseeing. That's how I made so, the trip out to the pyramids. So it wasn't a training uh, period then? No, no. They you were, just they were trying to figure out what to do. to do with us. Oh my goodness sakes. But um, <laughs> hurry up and wait. Hurry up and wait, the old <laughs> army game. Yes, yes absolutely. Uh, but uh, finally then I was uh, uh, assigned to the 376th Bomb Group, which was just then being set up. Mm -hmm. And uh, this was in North Africa. Now, was this the 16th Air Force? No, this would have been the... Uh, Maybe the 18th? The 9th, 9th Air Force. 9th Air Force. Yeah, and uh, so they they flew me up there to a little town called Saluk, which was out in the desert, <laughs> and uh, wow. it, it was a this is the area that Rommel had been in. Yes. It's interesting because uh, shortly thereafter, then we moved up to. Benghazi, oh. which was right on the Mediterranean. Yeah. And Benghazi was referred to as uh, Mussolini's jewel of North Africa mm -hmm. because when they made their effort to take over Ethiopia, everything was funneled through Benghazi. And uh, in so doing, they redid the, uh, the so, port, you know, yeah. and uh, made a beautiful little town. I mean, they had all this gorgeous marble all over the buildings and sidewalks and everything. And it had been pretty, but it had been pretty well bombed out, too. Yeah. They, had, they had big port facilities there, didn't they? Uh, you say big. I don't know how big big it is. Well, but big for the Mediterranean. I yeah, guess. being able to handle uh, transports and things yeah, like that. Yeah, because that, that's exactly what what Mussolini wanted. Sure. And um, fortunately, he didn't make the grade. <laughs> right. <laughs> but anyway, we were just a few miles outside of Benghazi. Actually, it was all desert, but then it went down to the Mediterranean. Mm -hmm. Beautiful to look at. But sandstorms were the, the almost daily occurrence. Goodness. And they were miserable. And as a matter of fact, uh, on occasion, they were so bad. They'd last for two or three days, and all oper operations would shut down. They, right. they couldn't fly. Oh. And had big uh, canvas covers that they would cover over the planes because the front of our bombers were covered with what they called plexiglass. Yes. And uh, this stuff would... <laughs> It'd just be like a sandblast on it, you know. So they would cover all that, cover the engines, 
so that they would not get all the sand in them. Yeah. And uh, so that'd go on for maybe three days. That sand got into everything, didn't it? Pardon? The sand got into everything. Absolutely into everything. I had a footlocker that I thought closed up pretty tight. When I got back home and took stuff out of there, down in the bottom was sand yeah. that had seeped in. And sand from the Sahara. From the Sahara. <laughs> Good yes. golly. That's true. That's true. <laughs> and um, but uh, and you you try to eat. You know they had a tent set up for a mess hall and uh, try to get in there. And all the plates were turned uh, yeah. upside down. Yeah. You turn over your plate, and before they could slop some food on there, you had a coating of sand on it. Isn't that so? Yeah. But oh, uh, well. we lived through it. Sure, you survived. Yeah. Well. Um, so you said you were there at Saluk for about six to eight weeks? Uh, I, not even that long. At, at Saluk, I don't think I was there more than eight, ten days. Oh, I see. And uh, it, one interesting thing there, uh, I remember the biblical stories of how the grasshoppers uh, uh, annihilated the food right. chain. And the at this, this time, grasshoppers had swarmed and they weren't little grasshoppers like we have, like that. I mean, these things were huge and uh, they'd find they'd hit you in the head and Ooh. it would hurt. Oh. And uh, to say nothing of getting in the engine the shells. <laughs> but uh, anyway, uh, we got out of there and then we formed there at Benghazi. Four squadrons, five, twelve, five, thirteen. 514th and 515th squadrons, four of them, dispersed on the field. How many planes to the squadron? I think there were about, I don't know, 10 or 12. Okay. Yeah. And um, tell, us, tell us about that Liberator. How did you feel? Did you like it as, a, as an aircraft? Uh, well, not, feel? not being a flying officer, I can't speak from that. As far as flying, but as a... But we, we thought it was the world's greatest. I yeah. mean, you know, all the the uh, uh, stuff we would read was on the B-17, the B-17 this, the B-17 that, and they yeah. were so wonderful and all this. But the B-24 carried a heavier bomb load, it flew higher, and it also uh, had a greater range. Yeah. So... Uh, Lockheed, or Consolidated, did a great job with that. Oh, plane. my yes, my yes. I should say. And uh, they used to come back uh, some of them so badly shot up, you, you wonder how they stayed in the air, yeah. but but they did. Very strong. And they bring them back. Airworthy, I should say. Uh, now, on, on, on your missions, uh, have you got a story about a particular mission or anything? That... No, because I did not go on missions. Oh, you didn't? No. See, I was a, a ground personnel. Okay. All right. And All right. I, had, I had a crew of about 14 men that... Uh, worked under me to maintain all of the equipment right. on the planes and uh, do the training of new crews as they came in. Mm -hmm. uh, so I did not fly on missions. Mm -hmm. That's how I happened to stay over so doggone long. Flying personnel would come over and they would fly their required number of missions and go back home sometimes. They could be back home within four to six weeks. Right. I was over there over two years. Oh, about that. So, uh, uh, no, I, I, I can't speak from that standpoint. Well, I, I understand. I just was wondering if, uh, uh, if you'd had a, a, a test flight or anything like that in that plane. Of course, you flew oh. in the plane somewhere, didn't well, you? Oh, yes, yes, uh, numerous times. And uh, I'm one. Uh, when we were at Benghazi, they used to fly what they called Cossack missions. Cossack missions? Yeah. Uh, this would be a flight down to uh, Cairo to pick up goodies. Oh, yeah. You pick up uh, a little bit of booze and perfume for some of the guys that sent home and uh, other little goodies. Yeah. So I went down on one of the Cossack flights, 
<laughs> and um, we came back. It was dark then, and they were supposed to have uh, a beacon sending out a signal where the airport was, and uh, the beacon was not operating. So we were flying around there, and the IFF, Identification Friend or Foe, mm -hmm. was not operating on the plane I was on. So here we are trying to find the, the base and the land, and suddenly the British anti-aircraft guns started to oh. fire at us. And we couldn't, uh, we couldn't get anybody, uh, you know, to realize the so-called friendly fire. So-called friendly oh, fire. Oh my goodness! But uh, eventually, we did get down, and uh, so it, it was an interesting incident. I should say, yeah. well, you were lucky too. Very, very <laughs> lucky. Well, I had a number of occasions when I, uh, I'm saying, you know. Ooh, with the grace of God, there goes I. I know. Did your did your base get ever get raided by the enemy? They would uh, they would occasionally send raids down. Most often, yeah, um, but uh, not much. No, uh -huh. we, we got a little more of that in Italy when we got over to <coughs> Italy. Well, now tell me about that. So you were in North Africa uh, now. You were in on the invasion of Sicily, were you? When you say you were, I mean, did you, you have? Did we run missions on the? Yeah. Area? I don't know. I'm sure we did. But you were still based in Benghazi. In Benghazi. Yeah, because the Germans were still uh, here in uh, Italy. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Sure. And, uh, and that wasn't very far across the water from Benghazi. To to Sicily and then to Italy, of course. Well, uh, no, that's, that's true. But, um, and, and that brings up <laughs> an interesting incident with Walter. Okay. Walter Foster. Your brother-in-law. My brother-in-law. Uh, as I mentioned to you, sometimes we had these sandstorms come in off the desert. And we moved up as Rommel moved west on North Africa, we moved in behind him. Right. We moved our base up, and finally got into Tunisia. Mm -hmm. We set up a base in Tunisia. Uh, but uh, anyway, we had one of these three-day sandstorms, and I had heard about a song. Dirty, dirty from Missouri. Sure. And I never heard the whole song, so I don't know what dirty, dirty was or who she was. But I wanted to see Missouri. Sure. And at, <laughs> at that time, Walter who was an uh, armament officer, or gunnery officer. Yes. On LSD. And I knew he was in the Mediterranean someplace, but of course I didn't know. Had no idea where. So I said to my friend Charlie, I said, Charlie, we can't do any good here. Let's go find Walter. And uh, let's go up to Bizzurdi. He said, OK, let's go. So we hopped in the Jeep, and off we went for Bizzurdi. And uh, How far away was it? Oh, maybe 70, 80 miles. Not bad. Yeah. yeah, not bad. So we got up there, and it was, it was nighttime. I went down to the port authority and I said, uh, can you tell me if LST-357 is any place around? He said, well, why do you want to know? And I said, well, my brother-in-law is a gunnery officer on 357. And uh, of course, we were in uniform and everything. And I had my uh, identification. And uh, he said, well, let me look. He said, yeah, as a matter of fact, it's out in the, what they called the lake, which is the outer part of the, uh, of the harbor. Up at the harbor there. <laughs> and, uh, I'll that. He said, I can't get you out there tonight, but he said, if you want to stay over, he said, I'll, I'll see if you get out there tomorrow. Great. So he put us up in the BOQ for the night, 
And the next morning, early, Charlie and I went down and they had a Navy uh, ship that took us out to the 357. Uh, and they'd land in that over the side. Well, if you've never climbed a landing net, you have no idea what misery that is. <laughs> so here's two absolute land lovers <laughs> trying to call, climb the Navy's landing net. And uh, all, the, all the Navy personnel down there were laughing, laughing and a big time. Sure. And, um, but we finally made it up to the top. <laughs> and I put my leg over the railing, and as I did, officer came out the cabin door and started to walk on down. And he got down about 20 feet. And I said, Walter! <laughs> and he turned around and he looked at me. He couldn't believe that I was there. Art ball. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, uh, so, of course, he came back. And Charlie and I then, we stayed there overnight, had the first shower we'd had since we left the state, hot shower, I should say, yeah. since we left the States. And uh, what we considered a great meal. I mean, the Navy personnel, we thought, ate much better than we did. <laughs> But, oh, it was a tremendous uh, meeting, and w one of those, one chances in a million, you know. I should say. And, uh, oh, that's a remarkable story. It, it really is. There you are, 5,000 miles from home. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, fantastic. That, that's incredible. Well, I'll, uh, uh, so there, there you were. You did get to Missouri, though. We did get good. No, I never did find Dirty Gertie. Didn't find Dirty Gertie. And, and I remember um, there were some respectable lyrics to that song, but then there were some versions, as you could well imagine, uh, and with a title like Dirty Gertie from Missouri. Yeah. You can imagine what some of the, uh, the, uh, the censored uh, lyrics might be like. Where, where did you see your service? I was in the Navy, and I was in the South Pacific. Oh, then you did mention that. Yes. Yeah, right. But uh, uh, getting back to your situation now, did you get out of North Africa? Did you get to oh, Italy? Yeah, absolutely. We we got um, when we the Germans finally moved out of North Africa, and um, uh, then they started to move up from the toe of Italy or the heel of Italy, I should say. Yeah. Italy, Italy shaped in the right. shape of a boot. Yeah. And um, so the down southern part of uh, the heel, uh, there was a small German fighter base there. And um, of course the Germans were already moving up through Italy. And uh, we were planning to move over there. And they, all of the staff officers, which included me, my friend Charlie, uh, all the staff officers were flown over to this base, which was kind of silly in a way because we had no equipment there, nothing to service the planes with. <laughs> so we were there for, I guess, what, 10 days with nothing to do but sightsee. Oh my gosh. And, um, what a great experience. So uh, we ended up then in a small fighter base that was the engineers came in and lengthened it for the B-24s mm -hmm. and uh, <clears throat> all of our ground personnel and uh, uh, all the equipment was put on ships and sent up to Brandisi Harbor, mm -hmm. which would have been on the east coast. On the Adriatic. Yeah. On the Adriatic, right. yes. And um, there the Germans uh, produced their last big air raid of the war, and they really played havoc. And we lost more personnel <laughs> there than we did all the other rest of the time we were on base. But uh, finally our equipment did 
and get uh, down to us. And uh, we set up the base there and started operations. But the Germans were still only about uh, 100, 150 miles north of us. And they used to play, put nuisance raids out. They didn't really drop anything, but they'd come down like an, they were having an air raid. And of course, uh, the sirens would go off and everybody would have to put their gas mask on and their helmet and go out in the, in the uh, flood trenches. Mm -hmm. uh, but then they'd never drop anything. They didn't have anything to drop? Didn't have anything to drop. So, uh, <laughs> anyhow, uh, we set up our base there in uh, uh, San Pancrazio, down in the southern part of um, the, the heel yeah. of the boot. Uh, Did you have an opportunity to intermingle with Italians? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. And uh, which is another interesting story. I guess I could talk forever. Well, I think it's wonderful. But um, when uh, when Charlie and I were over there, uh, you know, with nothing to do, and we well, let let go someplace. Sure. And so we walked into the little town of San Pancrazio, and this is a typical little Italian town. All of the, the only thing that grew around there were grapes mm -hmm. and a little further north, olive orchards. But um, uh, we walked down to the train, train station and there was a train going, leaving. We didn't know where it was going. We bought a ticket. I don't know. Every time we moved, they would give us what they called invasion money, I guess you know mm -hmm. too. Mm -hmm. So we had the lira to spend and we bought a, a ticket and got on the train on a cattle car with everybody else. And um, his car rattled along the rail and I guess maybe in an hour, hour and a half, uh, we ended up in a little town called Lecce, uh, a pretty little town. Pardon me. Was this near the coast? Yes, it was further south, yes, uh, very near the coast. Yeah. And um, so we walked around and uh, uh, really didn't do anything. And there was uh, uh, one hotel, we didn't know where to go to get anything to eat, but um, uh, figs were for sale at every place, and uh, dried figs. So we bought figs and uh, uh, I forget what else, not much else available. I mean, the Germans, when they left, they took everything with them. Oh, sure. sure. And um, uh, so we, there was a little hotel there. We went in and made our wants known. Oh, and you mentioned about intermingling with the Italians. We had any number of people come up to us and talk to us in English. and. Not, not very good, but not we could understand them. I've been to America. Yes. My brother lives in Chicago. Sure. He works in the packing houses. Okay. Or he lives here, he lives there. Yeah. Uh, it, it, it was amazing the number of people and no animosity whatsoever. Oh, oh. Uh, they were just delighted to see us. That was a most unholy alliance between, oh, absolutely. and it was those two nutheads Hitler and Mussolini yeah. that got it together. Yeah, and uh, <laughs> it, it, it was terrible. It was terrible because uh, and they were such friendly people, friendly yes. people, warm. And, and we liked them. Yes, warm, wonderful. People. And um, even even their language is pleasant to listen to. Oh, very musical, isn't other it? Other than the guttural German, and right. of course, I'm a German heritage, mm -hmm. but uh, that didn't make me like German. <laughs> uh, but um, anyway, uh, uh, we had a number of people, and subsequently, uh, I met a young lady down here. In fact, she came up to me, and she said, "Pardon me, may I talk to you?" I couldn't believe my ears. You know, here's this nice-looking young Italian girl 
speaking to me in perfect English. I couldn't believe it. And I said, oh, yes, what can I do for you? <laughs> of course. She said, well, she said, I just had to speak to someone in English again. And it turned out that uh, her sister, who was with her, and just a year or two older than she, had been married to an Italian doctor. Mm -hmm. And they lived there in Lecce. And um, he was, of course, in the Italian army, captured as a POW in England. And um, she lived there with her mother. Well, her mother was a Canadian. And uh, of course, her father then was an Italian. And they had come back on a visit because this sister, whose name was Christina, was going to have her, I don't know whether it was first or second child, I guess. And um, so they came back to visit, and that's when war broke out, oh. and they couldn't get back to Canada. Trapped there. Trapped there. How yeah. about that? Isn't that amazing? Yeah. And, what uh, a story. <laughs> so anyhow, uh, she invited my friend and me uh, to visit with them uh, sometime. Mm -hmm. Perfect opportunity. And uh, oh, she met her mother, and uh, yes. wonderful relationship. Yes. And in one of those books, I still have uh, pictures of them. And did they, you keep in touch with them over the years? I did keep in touch, yes, um, for a number of years. But then, it, you know, other things sure. became more important. And when I got back, I sent a lot of stuff over there because they were really hard up. Oh. And I sent interesting thing. I sent. Um, they had a gardener that did gardening for them. And uh, I sent over a lot of uh, uh, vegetable seeds. Mm -hmm. And uh, she wrote back and she said, we got tomatoes. And she said, nobody would believe those tomatoes because the tomatoes that they were used to seeing were maybe like that. Mm -hmm. The tomatoes she got from these seeds were like that, you know, huge. And it was interesting. Yeah, she said. So and, and then later on, after I was married, and uh, Ruth and I uh, were taking a, a trip on somewhere. I guess this was before we had the kids. And um, we said, let's go up to Canada to uh, see if we can find. Well, uh, I knew that Christina did not return. She stayed in Italy, and eventually her husband did return. And, um, uh, but Elena, and any number of American pilots that give anything to have married her, beautiful girl, but she married an Italian fella, but eventually moved back up to, um, uh, to uh, Canada, and we visited with her and her mother mm -hmm. in Canada, which was an interesting what you say? Situation. <laughs> so, uh, anyhow, I, I have some very pleasant memories. Well, you certainly do. How far north did you get? In did you get all the way up to, up the boot to the top of Italy, or? Uh, well, it, it, the base never moved oh, from no. where we were in, at San Pancrazio, uh, but uh, of course on rest leave. I got up to Naples, I got to Rome. Oh, good. Uh, we got over to Tel Aviv, Palestine. Oh, my. And, um, well, this, this is for staying over so long. Sure. <laughs> we had time to do that. But, uh, and then I had an interesting incident. Uh, on one occasion, I had to go up to Naples for uh, some special equipment. And uh, the army officer said, well, I'd like to go up there with you. And, uh, so we, both of us, uh, got in a jeep and off we went for Naples. And as we got in, uh, into Salerno, I think it was, the southern edge, uh, we saw this 
huge, like fireworks in the eye. And you know what's that? Well, we couldn't speak Italian, and the fellow couldn't speak English. All he could say was Vesuvius. Well, once he said Vesuvius, we knew what it was. My goodness. And uh, so we didn't think too much about it and went on into Naples and uh, got something to eat, put up at the officer's uh, BOQ. And next day, took care of our business. And uh, uh, I had remembered, you know, some of the Cincinnati schools early on had some beautiful artworks. Yes. And uh, in Westwood School, they had a number of them in some of the rooms. And I can remember one of them, the ruins of Pompeii. Oh. So, and uh, I. <laughs> I want to see, I want to see this stuff coming out of the volcano up there. Right. It's stupid, dumb. It's just, what you'd expect someone who was then what 23, 24 years old <laughs> to do. So as as we were leaving, we said, well, before we go back to our base, we're going up Mount Vesuvius and see the lava coming out of there. Well. Everybody streaming down, you know, you could see the, the Italian shaking their heads. Crazy Americans, crazy Americans. So up we went and suddenly a big blow up went and all this stuff started falling around this molten lava. Boy, the heck with this. I turned around and down we went. Boy, we went over trees and everything. And it got down and back down where we would recently be safe. I mean, well, it's the end of that, we'll go back the way we came. But they had the road blocked mm -hmm. because the, the silt had already built up to well, about six or eight inches. Mm -hmm. And they had the road blocked. <coughs> and the Italian police, the Carbonieri, said, you know, can't go, can't go. This Jeep can go any place. I uh, put it in four-wheel drive, went around the barricade, and got about two feet, and it stopped. Or four, all four wheels kept turning, <laughs> but we didn't move an inch. And of course, they were all standing back there laughing at us. <laughs> and uh, okay, so I asked him to help us push us back, and uh, so we had to go up through the Apennine Mountains, and this was the North of Rome, no. North of Rome, North, Jesus. Yep. Well, anyway, up through there, mm -hmm. where all of this volcanic ash had taken mm -hmm. on moisture and came down is pink snow. Mm -hmm. And there was six to eight inches of pink snow. Good heavens. Well, we did get through <clears throat> pink snow and ended up in a little town called Potenza. Beautiful little town, looked like one of these little towns you see on a, a Christmas card, uh -huh. you know. And uh, we finally got to the, uh, found a little hotel there and went in and said, we need a room for the night. He said, I can give you a room, but he said the Germans took all the blankets and sheets. So we don't care, we need a place to get out of this weather. And uh, so we slept between mattresses <laughs> and, uh, uh, and made it and the next day we finished our trip and got back to the base. Oh gosh. But, uh, Another remembrance. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I should say, well, um, before we run out of uh, time here, Art, <clears throat> uh, you finished up, uh, what was your, what was your final rank? A uh, captain. Captain? I could have, uh, had I wanted to stay on another another couple of months. Could have made a major. Could have made a major. Yep. Because I was, uh, when I came back to the state, <coughs> and I was sent out to a base at Pueblo, Colorado. Oh, for heaven's sake. And, um, yeah. Uh, well, I bet you were anxious to get home, weren't you? I was anxious to get home. The, the, uh, of course, you were getting out at that time according to the number of points yes. that you had generated. Right. And I had more points than anybody else on the base. I'll bet you. But the, the, uh, I was assistant uh, 
communications manager there, mm -hmm. and the manic the uh, the um, communication manager was major. The rank uh, the uh, position called for rank of major. Right. And they said, look, uh, if you'll just stay on a while, let me get out of here, mm -hmm. and you can become a major. But uh, it, that, it didn't mean anything to me. No, you had the opportunity to go home and that was it. And that, that was well, it. I, I, that, that's just a, a great, great story. And <clears throat> we want to, uh, to extend uh, our grateful thanks to you for your great service and uh, the opportunity to speak with you. So, uh, are we okay on time, Dennis? We're still got five minutes. Tell us about, uh, so then you came home. You didn't go to Pueblo, Colorado, right? Oh, yes, I did. Oh, you did go? Yeah. I, oh, I, that's I, right. You talked to him. Yeah. And, and he I, wanted you to stay on. It, I right. See. And I was there for, oh, I don't know, maybe six or eight weeks. Oh, I see. But uh, there are a couple other little interesting incidents that I think you might be interested in. Sure. we got five uh, minutes. You know, so many of the, the real heroes were the guys that got shot up or shot down oh, yeah. and put their lives on the line. Uh, fortunately, I missed a lot of that, most of that. Um, but there were occasions, for instance, uh, we were back in Benghazi and the, uh, uh, the planes had to be serviced there. And I was in a, in um, what they call the flight deck, where the radio equipment was located, uh, with one of the sergeants from my crew, and um, uh, and he was trying to get a radio out because it was not operating properly, and I was trying to help him. Well, in so doing, they had a position in the top of the cabin. Uh, where they would put uh, a, what they call a very pistol, a pistol to send out uh, uh, mm -hmm. communication, you know. Right. And uh, they were supposed to have been taken out when the radio operator got out of there. <coughs> On this one occasion, the radio operator did not take that out, and so my sergeant, in trying to get it out, pulled the trigger, and there had been a shell in there. Well, what happened was that this big canvas cover over the top maintained that uh, that phosphorus shell. Huh. And boy, did we get out of there in a hurry. Oh, and they were loading the wing tanks with gasoline at that time. This is 100 octane gasoline. Mm -hmm. and just a few feet from where this was burning through oh. the canvas cover. And I must say that it, the, the guy that was filling the tanks, uh, boy, he, in place of getting out of there like we did, he grabbed a fire extinguisher and went over and was able to extinguish that. Oh, Otherwise, okay. a whole plane and oh, we would have gone out. And the phosphorus fire is so vicious. Oh, my, Terrible. yes. Yes, it's dead. And yeah. how, how he got that out, he got on it. Well. Quickly. That, for one, and, uh, of course, Another story with my friend Charlie Weiss, but occasionally the plane would crash on takeoff. Mm -hmm. I mean, they were pretty heavily loaded. And they'd get down the end of the runway, and for whatever reason, they would, uh, they would crash. And uh, uh, so they would have been totally loaded with bombs, 100 octane gasoline. <coughs> and Charlie and his crew was from his squadron would have to get in there and disarm all those bombs. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, boy, it took a lot of guts to walk into with 100 octane gasoline pouring out of the tanks all around sure. you and all these 500 pound bombs right. uh, and ammunition. And he'd have to get in there with his men and disarm those bombs. Yeah. And uh, sometimes before they could even get injured. Uh, sure. Uh, uh, men off of there. Did you get any, uh, tell us about your commendations. Did you get 
air medals and so forth? Or? No, you only get air medals if you flew if you missions. Flew. Yeah, right. and since I flew no missions, I got no air medals. <laughs> I did uh, get a uh, bronze star. Good for you. Yeah. I got it. Uh, okay. Well, yeah. we are out of time, darn it. Okay. We could have gone on much longer, and I'm sorry well, we I'm, can't. I'm not, I'm not sure I told you what you really wanted. Well, to you certainly have. You've just spoken so well, and uh, you've told us some wonderful stories.